Thank you, Father, for tonight, Lord. I do pray, Father, that you would go before the message, Lord, just as we look at the book of Nehemiah and what you did with this man to change him, to grow him into that leader that you would have him to be, Father, to use him to do a work for you, Lord, that we would see areas that would apply to us that we would be able to uh, uh, desire to be like this man was, someone who was used by you, Lord, in in different aspects, Father, and raised up to be, Lord. So I pray that you go before us tonight, Father, and we thank you for what you're about to do, Lord. I pray that you'd use me, give me the words, fill me with your spirit, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So Nehemiah chapter 2. So what do we know about Nehemiah so far? We know he is Jewish. Uh, He's a captive. He was born in captivity, and somehow he has become a cupbearer. He serves the king his wine. He uh, is in a dangerous job. If someone's trying to kill the king by poisoning him, uh, Nehemiah is going to find out first. And that would be the end of Nehemiah, but uh, that's not the case. Uh, Nehemiah serves the king, but something has happened to Nehemiah. His heart has been touched. Uh, he's going along, and uh, I, every time I think of going along, I think of doop doing So he's doop doing along, and uh, he asks his brother when they come back from Judah uh, about how it's going. And he tells them that they're in distress and they're a laughingstock to the people around and the walls are torn down and the gates are burned with fire and he just loses it. It says that he sat down and he started to cry and then he started mourning and fasting, you know, for this wall and these people back in a place where he's never been. Um, a little side note, uh, in, during captivity, Because the temple was torn down, they started up these synagogues. And that is how they would get together and they would worship and and read the scriptures. They couldn't sacrifice or do any of that, but they would get together and learn about the Lord that way. So uh, he is still learning about the Lord. He knows about this land. He knows the stories, but he's never been there, never seen it. Um, Tonight uh, in chapter 2, we're going to continue on and see how God has pressed this this desire to go back and help on Nehemiah's heart. But who here would say that you are a leader? Who would say, yeah, I see that I am a leader? But who here could say that I could be a cup bearer? You know, I think we all could say I could carry a cup. I could do that part. And when we step out, every little bit God can use. God says, that's enough. I created you, and I gave you the ability. Moses said, I can't speak. He says, I can do it. I can do the work in you. I I, I, I can do it. He's like, fine. I'm still going to use you. But I'm going to use you with your brother Aaron. Nehemiah could have said, I'm just a cupbearer. I've never worked a day in my life on a building. I've sat inside this castle with air conditioning and people, whatever, all my life. I've never picked up a hammer. He says, I want to use you. We may not all be leaders, but we can all be used by God to lead. So Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. Now, Nisan is the first month of the year. It started during Passover where the Lord got them out of Egypt. And on that night when the the angel was going through and killing all the firstborn, God said to them, he says, I want this to be the beginning of years for you. This is the beginning for you. This is where it all starts. That's the month of Nisan. That just recently happened, just a few weeks ago. But this is also the 20th year of Artaxerxes. About four months ago, which have passed between chapter 1 and chapter 2, about four months ago, it was still the 20th year of Artaxerxes. They're going by a Persian calendar. They're going by a different calendar. But the Jewish calendar, the Hebrew calendar, this is the beginning. And this date is important. It's very important. See, it's a date that we should all be aware of. Daniel had been given a vision 
in the book of Daniel of future events and even the end of the world. And that's in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 25 is where I'm going to pick up at a little bit. And it says, this date was one given to Daniel and God's people so they would know when the Messiah would come. It says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. So, there's different views on this, and tonight we're not here to learn about Daniel, but to learn about the book of Nehemiah. I just don't want to pass this by without a little sightseeing as, as we go by. See, there is going to be a command to restore and build Jerusalem. And I believe we are talking about the city and not a specific building like the temple. We know that there has been a command to build the temple in Ezra chapter 1. So we have seven weeks and 62 weeks, 49 weeks. We're not talking about weeks of days. You know, seven days makes up a week. But weeks of years. So seven years would make up one week of years. So he's saying that there's going to be seven weeks and 62 weeks, making 69 weeks, 483 years. Now, I'm not going to do the math. You know, there's lots of different people that can do that to try to figure out the 360-day calendar, the 365-day calendar, when it started, when it stopped. That's not what I'm trying to do. But this is an important time. This prophecy goes even further into the future to talk about the Messiah dying and the destruction of the city again. See, there was a decree made by Cyrus to Ezra that gave the captives the right to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple in 538 B.C., and that's in Ezra 1 and in chapter 5. Darius made a decree giving Ezra the right to rebuild the temple in 517 B.C., which is in Ezra chapter 6, verse 6 through 12. Artaxerxes made a decree giving Ezra permission, safe passage, and supplies to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple in 458 B.C., Ezra chapter 11 through 26, or chapter 7, verse 11 through 26. Artaxerxes makes a decree here tonight, giving Nehemiah permission, safe passage, and supplies to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and the walls in 445 B.C. See, here in Nehemiah, chapter 2, 1 through 8, out of all of these decrees, only the last one of these four decrees was a command to restore and build Jerusalem. So, the first three each focused on the temple, not on the city or its walls. So, this is why I believe, a lot of people believe, that this date is so important. And if you want to know more about this chapter in Daniel... I dug up the teaching that was buried inside of a couple of Revelation teachings uh, about an hour ago, and I put them on the website. So if you look at the website, new messages, there's going to be two of them from today. Uh, I called it uh, Daniel chapter 9, the vision, part 1 and part 2. And Brad gave a good uh, teaching from Revelation, Matthew, and Daniel uh, on this 70 weeks if you'd like to go and look at it. It's just the audio. Uh, if you want the video, talk to me and I can link it up for you. But uh, I also posted a description. It's Revelation chapter 6. Uh, I think it was in October of 2017. If you wanted to go look at the video for yourself, you should be able to find it. Uh, but anyways, Nehemiah goes on and says, I was doing my job as cupbearer, but I was sad. I had never been this way before, but on this day, I couldn't help it. See, like I said, this is about four months after Nehemiah had heard of the condition of Jerusalem and how the people were getting along. Chap or verse 2 says, Therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad, since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadly, dreadfully afraid. See, the king notices Nehemiah's countenance, and he said, You're not sick. You can control this. 
And to be sad in the king's presence could be the end of your career and your life. So he was instantly afraid and trembling. And it says, he goes on and said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? Basically he's saying, please don't kill me. Live forever, king. My job is your safety. But my family, my father's, my homeland, my city has been destroyed. The gates are burned. Psalms 102 says, For your servants take pleasure in her stones and show favor to her dust. See, there is a love that the Jews have for this city, for Jerusalem. He says, Then the king said to me, What do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. See, he says, there's hope for you. There's hope for Nehemiah. He's not going to die. What do you want? God's moving on his behalf. The king is willing and wants to know what it is that Nehemiah wants. When he was asked, what do you want? He immediately goes to prayer. Something to the point, I'm sure. Help me. Thank you. He has been seeking the Lord for four months, asking him daily to either remove this burden or to help him to know what he needs to do. Why am I feeling this way? Why am I so concerned? How he can be a part of rebuilding the city, but he can't just leave. He needs to get permission, so he prays. Psalm 105 says, Search for the Lord and for his strength. Continually seek him. He was continually lifting this up to the Lord. Psalm 4 verse 3 says, But know that the Lord has set apart for himself him who is godly. The Lord will hear him, will hear when I call to him. See, even though we may not hear when God answers, know that he hears all of our prayers. Even when they're as quick as, to the point as Nehemiah's, God is listening. If he's recording your hairs, if he's catching your tears in a bottle, if his thoughts towards you are more numerous than the sand on the sea, then he hears your prayers. See, Nehemiah didn't know that the Lord had prophesied about him. See, this sad face is what God used to get this conversation going. It is what will cause the king to issue his decree to rebuild the city and to start the clock ticking until the time of Jesus Christ. But Nehemiah didn't know all of this. It says, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king... And if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. So now we get a glimpse of what Nehemiah was praying. If it's your will, king, send me. If God was not going to remove this burden, then let me go. Let me be a part of the solution. Let me rebuild but that's not all Nehemiah was doing during those months of praying. He was also asking the Lord to provide. Now, I've been looking at building a fence. My neighbor said my dog's leaving things in his grass that he doesn't want there. So uh, I'm, I'm looking at this fence, and uh, I, I want to make a barrier that's going to keep the water out. And I want it to be strong enough that I don't have to replace posts and, you know, I have uh, a good view on the other side. The neighbor's got some pretty green grass. I go and mow his grass because I don't have none. But I'm looking at this fence. I've already looked at some pipe. I've looked at some weld wire. I've looked these things up. I've been planning. I haven't built a thing. I haven't lifted a hammer. I haven't done anything except plan. I'm looking at building a fence. I believe this is what Nehemiah has been doing the whole entire time. He says he's been praying, but he's also been planning. He's making a list of things he might need, praying about how to get them. You see, I need a way to get there. You know, I, I looked it up on Google Maps. It's about 900 miles. Some people say 800. It's going to take a month for one person to walk there without company. And when you're hauling a bunch of trees with you, 
you know, it's going to take you even longer. I'm going to need a way to get there. I'm going to need a place to stay when I get there. You know, they said it was destroyed. I'm going to need a place to stay. I'm also going to need some building materials. How do you fix a gate in a desert without lumber? I'm going to need some building materials. I don't have the resources. I need help. See, I don't know how you're going to do it, God. But if you're calling me to do this, then you're going to have to take care of the details. He could have asked for the king to send his brother or someone else. You know, uh, he's put it on my heart to send you. You know, I've been given the gift to find out what your gift is to tell you what you need to do. You know, it's, he's not saying that. He's put it on my heart. You know, Nehemiah doesn't ask for someone else to be sent. He says, Lord, use me. Send me to Judah to rebuild the wall. And when it comes to leaders who are the ones you see who are taking the needs of the people to the Lord and stepping out to fill those needs. That is the example Nehemiah is setting of a good, godly leader. It is easy to say, I have a gift in this area so I can do this. I'm gifted in carrying cups. I'll carry cups. I'll carry a cup all the way to Jerusalem. But that's not what he said. He said, no, I'm not gifted in this area, but God, use me. Send me to Judah to build a wall with those things they call hammers and whatever else they use. Nehemiah is different because he said, I don't know how to do that, but I'm willing to do it for you. Verse 6, then the king said to me, a queen also sitting beside him, how long will your journey be? And when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. The response, how much time do you need? Well, I told you it's going to take him about, I don't know, I'm guessing four or five months for him to even get there. You know, that's almost a year right there, just travel time, before doing any work. How much time do you need? Uh, I don't know, this project could take a week, a year. I always seem to think that it's going to take a whole lot less time than it actually does. How long does the nursing mother's room take to, to re-sheet rock? A few days? I don't know. How much time is it going to take you to do it? Uh, a little while longer? <laughs> I can only imagine how long Nehemiah thought it would take, but we know that in chapter 5, verse 14, and in chapter 13, verse 6 of Nehemiah, uh, he was gone for 12 years. How long will it take? I'm thinking 12 years. And the king was still okay to let him go. In fact, it says he was happy to let him go. Nehemiah understood that behind all of this was God's hand. See, there's a teaching that says that Nehemiah was once, was not once, but one of a few cupbearers. They get this from verse 1 where it was his turn to pick up the cup. I took the cup and gave it to the king. Uh, this could be true. You need people you can trust to serve the wine and taste it. And if there is no poison, that's good. But if there is, then who's going to step up when that one goes down? So you've got a couple of guys that you can trust. You know, but what he's saying is, um, I need someone else to do my job for 12 years. I need permission to leave for 12 years. I need finances to support me for 12 years. I, I need help. Nehemiah must have been very close to the king because we see that he gets his request, but the king also wants him to come back. The qualities of this leader go beyond this one project, back to the job he's been doing for so long. And the king not only was happy to, go, to let him go, but was already looking forward to when he would return. It says, furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. Um, king, seeing as how you're so willing to let me go, uh, you think you could support my trip? You could be my financial backer? Um, I know there's going to be enemies when I get across that river. Will you give me letters granting me permission to go? See, once he crosses over that river, the river Euphrates, there's going to be opposition. 
Nehemiah wasn't challenged while he was praying. He wasn't challenged while he was planning. It was when he stepped out, when he was not only willing to be used, but he actually started doing what God put on his heart, that the opposition came. Nehemiah was preparing for this also. See, our enemy may not like it when we pray or plan, but he definitely takes notice when we start to act and do those things that we have been praying for. He says in a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertain to the temple, for the city wall, and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God, or of my God upon me. Allow me permission to cut down some of your trees, O king because I'm going to need some lumber for this project. Will you pay for the gates? Will you pay for my house? See, Nehemiah is making the king aware of all the things he may need and asking if he would like to be a part of it. Not only will I need all of this, but I'm going to need some carts to haul this stuff and animals. He is asking a lot, and he's going to see what God will do. Then it says, the king gave me all that I asked for. Nehemiah says, this is definitely the hand of God. I believe every one of these requests he had prayed for. You know, I've already built that fence in my mind multiple times. I've torn it apart and rebuilt it because I didn't like the way I built it in my own mind. You know, he has been planning this out for a while. How am I going to get there? How am I going to haul it? Well, if I have the opportunity and he asks me, then I'm going to ask for trees. I'm going to ask for money. I'm going to ask for the moon. It wasn't just something Nehemiah figured he would ask for one day out of the blue, but he'd been praying for this for a while. He'd been pondering this. See, it all started with God touching him and placing this burden on him. And now we see that the Lord is touching the king and giving him a willing heart also. See, then it says, the king gave me all those things according to the good hand of God, which was upon me. We see that Nehemiah recognizes that God was behind all of this. He gives the credit to God. That's why I was able to get all of these provisions, because the Lord had his hand on it. See, this is a common theme in the book of Ezra. Multiple times it says, The hand of God was upon it. The hand of my God was upon me. Here we see it in Nehemiah. A leader, a godly leader, is one who recognizes where the help has actually come from. Who's actually behind all of this? It was God who did it. It is one of the characteristics of Nehemiah. See, leaders like this, they don't take the credit for the work God is doing. And even when it looks like a man was willing to help, they know it was God behind the scenes. He was the one doing the work. Then I went to the governors in the region beyond the river and gave them the king's letter. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. So in verse 9, we change. We change from praying and planning. Now he's moving out. He's got his resources. He's on his way. He's now made it to the river. He's crossing over. He's going into the territory, the land beyond the river. And I gave him the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. See, we see that not only did the king do what Nehemiah had asked, but he went above and beyond. He gave him an entourage of security to keep him safe. Horses, food, everything else he needed to transport this stuff. And Nehemiah was not going out in his own power, but he had the authority and the power of King Artaxerxes. But more than that, he had the authority of God behind all of this. See, we are not only called to go into all the world to share the gospel with others, but when we do, we won't be going alone. God goes with us. You know, I was talking to Chris Petty on Sunday about Mexico and looking forward to going and spending some time with these guys. He said that as soon as the kids found out the dates, they were excited. 
They were overjoyed and looking forward to us coming down. See, that is not something any of us has done. It is God going before us. And when we are willing to be used like in Mexico, he does amazing things. And it's all because of him that there is a group of kids waiting for their tongue-tied amigos to come from the north to come and love on them. It says, when Sam Ballot, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. Talk about some animosity. Something's going on here between these guys and the Jews. They don't like one person coming to help. Someone's come to help these guys. They come with letters from the king. See, the news of this made Sam Ballant and Tobiah very angry. Their faces may not have looked like they were. They could have looked normal. But if you could have seen their hearts, you would have been shocked. That's how they felt about this news. These two were in official roles under the king. And looking back, they could have been the ones responsible for stopping the work in Ezra chapter 4. See, these guys are most likely from Samaria and nations or the areas around. And Tobiah was a relative to Eliashib, who is a high priest. In chapter 13, verse 4, we hear of this, who during the rebuilding will be trying to stop the work by writing back and forth with the Jews to plot against Nehemiah. See, these were evil guys who were even against their own people. He says, so I came to Jerusalem, and I was there three days. Nehemiah didn't just jump right in. He took time to take it all in, to see how the people were getting along. But he doesn't do much for those first few days. You know, I think about people who come in to take over a position, and how they come in and they start changing things right away, and how the workers get all bent out of shape because they're making all these changes, and they don't even know how things go. They don't even understand what's going on. Nehemiah just stops. He takes it in. Maybe he's recuperating from his journey. Maybe he's spending some more time praying. Lord, I'm finally here. You brought me here. Thank you. Thank you for being so faithful thus far. It says, then I arose in the night. I and a few men with me. I told no one what my God had put in my heart. I hadn't shared the plan. I hadn't told anybody that I had this burden to be here, that I couldn't stop. If I would have stopped, I would have, I would have exploded, poof, gone. I, I, I had to. I had to. I couldn't help it. I was willing to risk it, even talking to the king. He says, I didn't tell anybody about this burden that the Lord had put on my heart and what I was going to do at Jerusalem, nor was there any animal with me except the one which I rode. So he goes out. In the night, he's all alone except for these guys. It's quiet, and Nehemiah is taking it all in. He was deeply moved when he heard of this wall back in Shushan, the citadel. And he is now getting his first real good look at it. See, Nehemiah was so broken over this wall without even seeing it. It doesn't say, but it is possible he was again brought to tears after he was able to see the amount of destruction firsthand. His first trip, three days, didn't say nothing. And now he's taking it all in. I imagine it was a full moon where he could see everything clearly. It says, and I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent gate. And I have a slide here. Um, I don't know how accurate some of this stuff is, but he's kind of going in a counterclockwise direction. But it says, I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent well and the refuse gate and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down and its gates, which were burned with fire. So he starts at the valley gate, which is going to be right. Uh, let's try. It's probably right about there, I'm guessing. Go ahead. Let me see the next slide. That tells me the name so I know. Yeah, that one. We're doing good, except this one's flipped to the other one. Valley Gate. Valley Gate, right there. And he's going to go to the Dung Gate. You know, here he's going around the King's Pool, going over here. He's going to go this direction. Got it? So he starts at the Valley Gate, then he goes towards the Serpent Well. He is going in a counterclockwise direction. He views and inspects the walls. See, this word viewed means to examine like a doctor, a wound. 
He looked at every area of the wall and its gates. See, at this time, it's been about eight to nine months since he first heard of this place, and he's finally able to see for himself just how bad it is. To remember just how his heart was stirred when he first heard of all of this. See, we could all use a good walk down memory lane. Look at the life God has rescued you from. He's remembering what stirred his heart, uh, this wall, these people. And now he's finally there, and he's looking at it. This is what prompted me to come here. This is the project I had in mind, and there it is. We could look at the life God has rescued you from and where he's calling you to. Remember those first works and do them again, it says. Don't grow stagnant in your walk. Get ready for the new work God would do in your life today. It's good to pull back the onion skins every once in a while. Not just to look at the ugliness of our hearts, but to remember those areas that are so far back, pull off this year and that year, back when I first started walking with the Lord and how he was so faithful then. And I hung on every word. I prayed about everything. I believed everything like a child. Remember that, what he's done and what he's brought you from, where he's taking you today. It says, then I went on to the fountain gate, to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal under me to pass. So he continues walking around, looking at the task at hand, working on a plan, praying, seeking. I had one more slide. That's Nehemiah's wall, I believe, after a little bit of uh, reconstruction and being knocked down again. But that would be part of it. Maybe I'll get a chance to see that here soon. So he's working on a plan. He's praying. He's seeking God. He's taking in the size of the project. He stopped at the king's pool. He's never been here before. So how did he know all of these places and what they were called? It is possible that the ones that are with him were like guides, telling him about the areas, what he's looking at, to show him around. It makes me think of all those who are planning to go on this trip to Israel. We've never been there. And we will soon have an understanding that we currently don't have or just what the Holy Land looks like, where these gates were. The pool, I hope to know where it's at. We will be able to share and speak with understanding, not just hear about this city, but like Nehemiah did, go there. See firsthand this area we've been praying for, the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Yeah, it's a land far away that I've never seen. One of these days I'll be able to see it. I'll be able to see its people. I'll be able to pray with more specificity, with more excitement, to know the areas that are around when I'm talking about this area. He says, so I went up in the night by the valley, viewed the walls, then I turned back and entered by the same gate I left, the valley gate, and I returned. And the officials, they did not know where I had gone or what I had done. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or others who did the work. Mum's the word. See, no official, no one of influence went with Nehemiah. See, he's still seeking the Lord to guide him, praying about the project in front of him. It wasn't time to bring in all the officials. It's still time to give it to God, a lot of prayer and planning. Now, preparing this study, something happened today. We're at Lunch Bunch. The cups don't have lids. We have cups with lids, but the cups for the water don't have lids. They don't have the right lids. And I hope the Lunch Bunch people aren't looking at this. I'm not trying to pick on you, but it's time to pray. And I'm just trying. It's, it's 11.45. It's time to pray, guys. You pray. We have to do this. You know, and we all could get together and help tackle this. We have some time. It's not that big a deal to wait a little bit longer to do the cups after we pray. You know, Nehemiah, he's putting the first things first. You know, how is our day going to go if we put the Lord last? You know, he's saying, let's start with prayer first. Let's start with God first. We'll worry about that project later. And not that they hadn't already prayed, I don't know how many times already. But I just thought, is that one of those things I do? I'll do that in a minute. 
I'll do that later. This is important. Is it really? Is it really? I think the most important thing would be to put the Lord first. And that's what Nehemiah is doing. He told nobody. He's planning. He's praying. He's giving it to God. It says, then I said to them, he must have got all the people together. You see the distress that we are in. He's now three days, right? Been there maybe four now. It's a, a new day. And we, do you see the distress we are in? Hey, wait, buddy, you just came from a castle. You came from Shushan, a citadel. Yeah, you've had a long, hard ride. But, you know, the distress we're in, come on. He says, no, you see the distress that we're in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. See, Nehemiah is the one God will use, but the people don't know that yet. He needs to bring the people in to get them on board. He starts by sharing his heart. Sometimes I find it hard to share about Jesus, just how wonderful he is, and not have the emotion come up in my throat. And do my best to be like a man and, and not blink because something might fall. And we're not going to have that stuff happen. We don't want to add more to the bottle. you know. And so uh, just to be able to speak about the Lord and to have that emotion. How can Nehemiah not talk about this project that he's been praying and fasting over and been heartbroken over, planning for for so long and not share with these people just how passionate he is about it. We're in distress. Let us build the wall. I'm a part of this, guys. I'm with you. Let's do it. See, Nehemiah can share about the destruction I don't see how Nehemiah can share about the destruction without that passion coming in. But he looks at the current state and he says, look at what we're in. Look at how it is. See, the people are in danger. Jerusalem, the city is in ruins and the wall and the gates are destroyed. See, the same thing that brought him to his knees crying out to the Lord is the vision he is passing along to these guys. It is important for people to be able to catch that same vision that you have. They can decide if they want to be a part of it. But this plan, this vision that Nehemiah has is one that the Lord has given him. He tells him the solution. The problem is, let's begin to work. It's time to stand up. It's time to get going. So question. Do you feel like your walls are torn down? Spiritually. Do you feel like your walls are torn down? Your life is in shambles. The gates that once kept the enemy out are burned with fire. See, I said last week that the enemy wants to come and tear down the walls that stand against him so that he has easy access to get back to you the next time he comes. Maybe your walls are like these around Jerusalem and they're flattened. And it feels like you're starting from ground zero and it's an uphill battle. God would want you to know he has a plan for you, a plan, a plan that includes rebuilding those walls. So be encouraged. God is not through with you yet. He who started the work will be faithful to complete it in you. Maybe tonight you're here and you know the people around you. We know each other. I know the person sitting in front of me and behind me. You know these people, and it's difficult to let them see what is really going on inside. Who knows? Maybe you're at home and you're watching this video from home. Who knows? It could be years down the road for all I know. But you're saying, that's me. Inside, there's damage. Oh, maybe the wall's not docked down. Maybe it's just cracked. Maybe it's leaning a little bit more than I'd like. Maybe the posts are burnt. Just a little bit. The enemy has been out there. The enemy has been doing a work. I think the Lord would say to us, I've already impressed it upon your heart. Get right with me. Let's do the work. I'm already doing the work. I've sent my spirit to testify that this is an area that I want to do work in. And you are praying about it. You'd like to take that step. You'd like to start to act but you're having a hard time with it. It's already there. The burden's already on your heart to be right with the Lord. Don't hold back. Step out. Begin that work again. 
It may be an uphill battle, but it's easier with two. And we need to recognize that God is behind this work. Maybe you need some help. Maybe you need some strength. You need a brother or a sister to come and stand beside you to encourage you while you do the work. Find someone you trust, someone who would pray for you and encourage you in this. I'm not saying go and divulge all your secrets, but just pray for me. I need to do this work, and I know God's going before me, but I struggle. Will you watch? Will you pray for me? Would you pray against the enemy from coming in? That's what Nehemiah did, in not so many words. But that's what the Lord would like to do with us, so that we could be those cities on a hill, shining a light for others to see. Not with holes through the wall, but the light flowing over the top. Let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight, Lord. What we see here in Nehemiah, yes, he was doing a physical job, but I believe there is a spiritual application you would like us to have here tonight, that you want to build up those walls in our lives, Lord. Walls are a good thing. They're not keeping us in. They're keeping the enemy out, Lord. But some of those walls, Father, I've knocked down myself. I haven't done it with the enemy's help. I wanted to see the other side. Father, forgive me of my sins. Turn me around, Father. Help me to look full in your face once again. Help restore the joy of my salvation once again, Lord. Father, I pray for all of us here tonight, Lord. We are not perfect, but we are perfect in you. Father, those areas that we've slipped up, Father, I pray that you do that work, Lord, that we wouldn't sit and pray and plan, but that we'd also take action in those areas you're calling us to, Father. Thank you for what you're about to do and what you've already begun. In Jesus' name, amen.